The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences. These are real people sharing very real, deeply personal experiences. This content may be considered triggering for others and for those who are sharing. The chat room is a privilege intended for discussions and sharing. You are not being asked to agree, but you are being asked to stay civil and refrain from personal attacks. Listener discretion is advised. All right, you're tuning in tonight. This is Am I Mental? A mental health live podcast where real people share real stories about their lives dealing with mental health and mental issues. With us, as usual, is the co-host KZ. Go ahead and say what up. Hey, what's going on? And um, before we get started and introduce tonight's uh, guest, you know what? Forget it. We'll just go straight to the guest here. Um, We have D on. Someone I've known for quite a while. Someone I've always respected. And kind of went through hell recently. So go ahead, D. Let's give a little bit of an update. Introduce yourself and let's get going. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, we have known each other for quite some time. Um, yeah, the the past uh, six months has been kind of a living hell. Ups and downs, lots of ups and downs, and uh, all pertaining to the health of my son. And if you're a parent out there, I'm sure you understand, um, you know, the, the the mental and psychological struggles that you go with when you find out something's pretty serious uh, about your son. Yeah, I I mean I have five kids myself. I know KZ has a few kids. I do. And we have Klutzana and May saying hello and good evening. Hi. That so means, where would you like me to start, E? Well, I mean, if you want to talk a little bit about I mean, you know, it depends on how much detail you want to go into. But, like, what was it that was wrong with your son? What started all of this? Well, it, the way it all worked out was kind of a, a blessing, if you will, because uh, so he started complaining about his back hurting. And me, having back injuries myself, I wanted to be proactive about it. And we sent him into the doctor's office. And um, his doctor was thorough and said, oh, let's get a scoliosis x-ray. And um, in that x-ray came out to where they said, it looks like he has a mass. So, of course, at that point, that's when me and mom kind of look right at each other and and stare. We're like, what's going on? And to be honest, my anxiety started going up immediately. Um, And then, so, it all started happening so fast. So, my anxiety was at one level. Um, which I would say, let's go from 1 to 10. I started out at about a 2 when we found out about the mass. And then okay. when, we did, when they determined how quick uh, they were going to examine this, I jumped up to like a 5 because they immediately said, you need to get a CAT scan now. And so we went and got a CT scan. Um, while we had the CT scan, I would have to say, my anxiety went to the point where I felt like I was going to have panic attacks almost all the time. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a big guy, uh, probably makes people uh, wonder or question how can such a big tough guy be? Well, it's true. I was losing it. And uh, when we got the CT scan, of course, they came back and said, yes, it is a mass. Um, it's about the size of a baseball and it's in his chest. And at the time, the first prognosis was that the mass was possibly connected to the top of the heart. Wow. So at this moment, mom's already crying. Uh, While the doctor's telling us about what the CT scan came out, I actually had to back up and turn around because I didn't want my son to see me break down. I just absolutely just lost it. Um, two doctors I didn't even know came up and was patting me on the shoulder. And and um, I'm, I'm kind of getting emotional now about it. Um, well, I mean, that was just so, six months ago. Yeah, this was January. 
So um, they said, obviously, we can't do anything about it in this rural area because, you know, he, I live in the sticks. Yep. And um, <clears throat> so they referred us immediately, emergency referral to UC Davis. Um, next day, I got in touch with UC Davis. And so as you see, the timeline's like really fast. It's day by day. Um, and then I start freaking out again because UC Davis calls us up. Um, the, uh, his oncologist doctor calls us up and says, I want you in the emergency room immediately. And I'm like, well, I'm four hours away. They're like, well, get down here. Whenever you get down here, it'll be all ready for you. So I'm freaking out. I mean, I'm literally having the shakes. Um, I'm assuming anxiety level nine at this point. Yeah, it's um, it was it was to the point where I was having a hard time having conversations other than what was going on at that particular moment. Like anything outside that bubble, my mind completely shut off. Like I didn't even have dogs anymore, even though I have dogs. But my mind just said, "You don't have dogs no more." Um, it was just it was all Rowan. It was all the focus of my son. So um, we get down there, get to the emergency room. They do a biopsy. And the doctors made us feel a lot better. So my anxiety dropped down probably about a number four at this point. A little bit more confidence, you know, trying to understand this thing. But I'm still scared that it's malignant. Um, And probably still scared that it's attached to the heart. Right. And what what problems that's going to cause. Um, so they had him do another CT scan and um, discovered it wasn't connected to the heart. Um, and then they did a biopsy, emergency biopsy, the next morning. So this is all happening so quick. And unfortunately, we had to wait seven days because the way UC Davis works is that they send out the biopsy to several um, um, pathology departments. So there could be a consensus. Um, That seven days was probably what I thought was hard. Um, I didn't get any sleep. I was so depressed. I got down to the point where I didn't want to do anything. I, uh, my anxiety wouldn't allow me to sleep. I would end up staying up until like five in the morning until my body completely shuts down. And then I would nap for like three and all of a sudden wake up. Um, the week comes by and they tell us we're sorry, but we didn't get enough tissue apparently to determine if it's benign or malignant. So our hearts sank. It was like we were starting all over again. Inconclusive has got to be the worst. Yes. And mom is at this point. If you even brought up the word or the subject with mom, uh, she would just cry. Didn't matter where we were, what we were doing. She'd just start crying. That's her baby. Yeah. Um, So this is the tough part. So since that we got that biopsy done, now we're starting to get into when the COVID thing started happening. He was scheduled for a surgery. Well, we think he already had the COVID because he ended up having a cough for six weeks, and that cough ended up postponing the surgery again. I was, at that time, I was starting to get angry. Um, I controlled myself, but there was times where I felt like I had to work harder to not control, uh, to be able to control myself. Um, they ended up postponing it. I'm, I'm seeing it to an all, all new low where I'm like reaching out to everybody to try to help me, um, kind of process what everything's going on. At the same time, I'm trying to be there for my wife, who's also going through the same emotional situation. And 
the depression at this time was it was dark it was dark because I could not stop thinking about worst case scenario I'm sitting here thinking to my mind I'm like what if I lose my son what if right. this is it what if, you know and I start thinking about his age I start thinking about his friends I start thinking about his school um, all the things he loved to do like I'm already thinking about it like as if he's already died and that that messed me up that messed me up and it it got to we're here for you man uh, it got to a point where um I told my wife I said uh if he goes, I'm going with him. I can't let him. I can't let him go alone. Laurel has you, and I got to be with him. So I actually was contemplating committing suicide if I lose him. So this is telling you at this point that. My depression was sunk to a pretty deep low. And uh, it wasn't right for me to tell my wife that, but I had to. She, I had to, she had to know where I was mentally. Right. And hopefully she was able to tell you where she was as well. She was. Um, she was in a... Uh, she had a hard time talking about it because she would just break down to the point where she couldn't speak. So you get a half sentence from her and, and the conversation was over. Um, so the COVID thing happens and gets postponed and then we finally get word that the hospital is um, canceling surgeries that are uh, elective, I believe they called it. Right. Like yeah, like surgeries that happened with um, my wife. Uh, for those that don't know, she's an OR nurse, and she was laid off basically because elective surgeries were canceled. Yeah, and um, so I again start freaking out. I'm going, "Is my son in that category?" Well, thankfully, the day after. They, now remember, during this entire time, and. He, you pro, you've seen it on Facebook, and you've seen um, me posting my things and and talking about how I can't sleep, and um, I was self medicating too much with alcohol. Um, I got really bad. Um, I was waking up like at noon drunk. Uh, I just I was looking for anything to kind of relieve myself. Yeah, irresponsible. I, I do think it was, but. I was scratching for anything at this point, but so they asked us if we wanted to do another biopsy or just go in and take it out. They already told us that it has to come out. We're like, okay, forget about the biopsy. I don't want to keep doing these surgeries. Let's get, um, let's just get it out. Let's get it take care. And your son was pretty gung ho with that idea too, if I remember correctly. He was, he was fed up with it. He wanted this to be over. Um, he was dealing with depression himself because of the fact that he's got this. He knows he has this tumor. It changed his life because he couldn't play any of the sports he loved. Um, it changed the. I mean, it changed he, the family dynamic. Yes, it, it did. Um, so when we decided that we're going to go ahead and get the surgery done and get it scheduled. Ron had to go through a couple of weeks of testing and stuff like that um, to make sure that he was all ready for it. And then um, we were walking on the beach after one of our doctor's appointments down there. And uh, the worst thing I thought was the worst thing that I could ever heard was uh, my son. He just flat out asked us, he's all, what if I die on the operating table? And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, oh my God, he's my 14-year-old son and he's thinking like this. 
these thinking about these things and I started I started getting scared for them and then I started overthinking it and I just did the best I can to be honest with them and try to you know um, it's hard coming from where I'm at mentally and I'm trying to scrape up as much adult parenting as I can to give the best um, advice and and um, you know support to my son. And something you that know, the listeners don't know is that you really didn't have much in the way of parental role models for most of your life. Correct. That this is this is me learning completely on my own. Basically, I had some role models, but they weren't around for very long. Um. But, uh, so we just told him the truth and we said, I don't, I don't think you're going to die, son. Uh, you're too healthy. You're too strong. You're, you're this and this and that. And I said, I want you to be honest with the doctors. I want you to ask them, the doctors straight up. If you truly do care about this, I want you to ask them. So, um, surgery time came up. We were all very thankful, but unfortunately I couldn't be there. Mom was only allowed to go in, and um, I told Rowan, ask all the questions you can possibly have, and he did. He flat out asked the doctors those same questions we were asked. But um, being in a hotel room and knowing your son is about to have his whole chest opened up where they can see his heart and his lungs and tumor and everything um i i completely broke down crying in the hotel room and i I did i remember when you posted the story about when he was talking to you and i was like well maybe all because you were talking about how you kept a brave face brave face brave face i still have to wonder if maybe the delays were because your son had to get it out had to get it off his chest that the delays were kind of maybe self, you know, like a, almost like a um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And, that, and I would, I would agree with that because of the way the timing, everything worked out. Um, there was always, it all happened for good reasons, the timing. Um, and I think he did need to hear that. I think he did need to hear it because after he asked about dying on the operating till the next question was right after that was, am I going to die of cancer mom? And to know your 14 year old kid is thinking like this, it's rough. It's uh, it forced him to grow up fast. Yeah, I would agree. Oh, I, I want to get some good news. <laughs> well, really fast, in, in the comments, Klatana was saying, oh, my heart, and sent you hugs with a crying face. And May said, it's hard not to show your fear to your children when you're you know, petrified. It's the hardest thing a parent ever has to do is to find the courage to do it. Yeah, I agree with both of those, and I, and I thank you for the hugs. And um... Yeah, we do have good news. <laughs> yes, we do have good news. So, thankfully, my daughter was there when he was going through the surgery because I was, I totally broke down because my anxiety went up, everything, because I knew at that time he was having his chest opened up. Um, it was a four-hour surgery. And um, I couldn't stop texting mom. Mom couldn't keep texting me because of where she was at in the hospital. She, her self-service would be blacked out. Um, my daughter was there. She held me. I held her because she was crying too. Um, but the surgery came out good. Uh, the doctor said everything worked out good. Uh, they didn't have to give him any blood because he didn't bleed much. Um, they got. They said they were 100% confident that they got the entire thing out. Uh, the scary thing was, is they said that they're very happy that it happened when it did because it went from the size of a baseball in just one month to the size of a softball. And then 
the other part of it grew from a size of a golf ball to a size of a tennis ball. And Yishi Davis has never seen this happen, ever. So it came out to find out that it was a thyma, uh, thym- <laughs> I'm going to screw this up, a thymoma tumor that grows off of the thymus gland um, in your chest. Um, it was, it came out benign. When I heard, when I heard the doctor say benign, I screamed in the car. I scared, <laughs> I scared my daughter so bad because when I heard Nora, she's on the phone and we're on our way home from the hospital. She's on the phone and doctor calls it. I just hear Nora say it's benign. And I just scream hallelujah, like really loud and but then I broke down crying and happy at the same time. It was, it was really, I had to pull off because my eyes filled up with so much tears. You know, you, you have to, you're trying to drive and you're having a hard time seeing through your eyes and stuff. And well, the I mean, you, just, you just found out that your son doesn't have to go through chemo, radiation, have to worry about it coming back or any of that. That's awesome. Yes. The worst case scenario kind of playing out. Um, so that that emotional relief was was such a high. It was such a high. I'll never forget this moment in my entire life. It's it's similar to the moment of when my wife tells me she's pregnant. And um, so he's doing well. He's healing well. I'm sleeping a lot better. I'm not drinking half as much as I used to. Um, I am still talking to people. I have a counselor that I talk to um, because I don't want these dark thoughts to keep coming up in my head and worrying. Um, He does have to be examined regularly and get MRIs for the next 10 years. Um, So that's the gist of the story. I mean, that is a hell of a story. That's a lot to have to deal with over six months. I mean, that's, yeah. that's basically six months of being in an emotional meat grinder. Yeah. And you got the COVID on top of it. Right. So yeah. And not knowing whether he had cancer or not that whole time. So you had to be extra cautious just in case he did. Cause immunocompromised are being potentially immunocompromised. Right. And to this day, we are being very cautious still. Well, because... yeah, he's healing from major surgery. Yeah, yeah. I saw yeah. the picture. It looked just like he's going to have the same scar that my grandpa did from multiple open-heart surgeries. It's the same opening, basically. Crack yeah. the chest. Yeah, and the wire closed. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Ray logged in. She's trying to catch up with what's going on. Klitsana is glad to hear that they are confident they got it. May sent hearts. Klitsana said the relief you must have felt dot 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 with more hearts. You're getting the love, D. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Um, I don't know what we would have done without the community. Um, the community really stepped up. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law put up a GoFundMe account and and uh, it's just I I just can't express or put in words how much the community actually came together and not only spiritually and and mentally and physically but also monetarily um, they helped us get through this and gave us a sense of secure ground and, and support that we really needed um, I don't know what I I can't imagine what it would have been like if I had nobody. All I got to say is our hometown, it's awesome. Yeah, that community has always been awesome, and I mean, you know it more than most. <laughs> That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I mean, it got to the point where. Now, I have to give a lot of credit to my son because he is a good kid, right? He's a, he's a real well-rounded kid. And it just happens that the newspaper editor knows my son really well. 
So they did a big article on uh, my son on the front page of the newspaper. Um, they carried over onto another page, and they put up the GoFundMe account, and wow. they really wanted us to be supported in that factor. Um, but uh, and and our neighbors right here uh, next to us, they they all put together bags and boxes of food and. You know, we weren't asking for anything. People just came together and just started putting stuff together and coming and bringing it to us. And um, when I'm going through that kind of depression, it's it really helped me from keeping myself from going over the deep end. Oh, absolutely. Losing, I mean, I could have lost my shit at any time and just started. You know, as a parent, you don't want to see your kid hurt. And I'm the type of person where I just, I, I overeat. My body literally just overheats, and I just want to—I just want to take down everything near me. You know, I—I <laughs> like, I hope I don't sound like an evil person, but you're not an evil person. It's—it's. It's I wouldn't body. be your friend if you—if we were evil. If you were evil, just, no. <laughs> it's just—it's just my thing. It's like um, everyone who messes with my kids is going to die, kind of attitude, but. Um, and when it's your own kid's body, what yeah. do you do? I, you know, I'm, a, I'm the kind of parent, and I'm sure you are too, and there's a lot of parents out there that are similar to me where um, if there's a problem, you want to fix it. Yep. And my mentality is that if there's a problem, I got to fix it. And I want to fix it now, and I want to fix it as soon as possible. Um Knowing my son had a tumor in his chest, and there was nothing I can do. That that all added up to, you know, my inability to control my emotions, and and um, I don't know. I don't think anybody out here in the world would blame you for it, though. I don't. Yeah. Nope. How about you, KZ? I, Oh no, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm listening to it, and it's one of those, you know, I, my, my oldest daughter is 14 years old, so it's one of those where I, I, I couldn't even imagine being in your shoes, and then I look at it. I was about four years older than than your boy there when I had my first major surgery. I uh, ended up in the hospital, uh, had two feet of intestines removed because they decided to rupture on me as a. Uh, uh, a complication of Crohn's disease. And I, I know where he was because I'm sitting there going, what if I don't come out of this operating room alive? And I'm like, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, but so, both sides of it suck. So do you remember, do you remember those, that questioning of yourself and how you were set mentally? I mean. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it, you know, it was there at the front of my mind The the, the really sucky part about it. And I, and I remember this specifically was, it was like, I don't know, a couple of weeks before I went in for the surgery that I was watching, it was like 60 minutes or something like that, where they were doing an episode on when people go in for surgery and they don't get uh, put under correctly. So they're awake while their surgery is happening. And I'm like, what the hell if that happens to me? And I'm like, yeah, no, I, I, I would prefer death over that any day of the week. Um, but yeah, no, I, I very much vividly remember going, you know, talking to my dad, like, what if I don't come out of this? You know, like, it, what if I don't wake up? And yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, I remember it very vividly. Well, the reason why I asked is because one of my questions was, is, how my my son was handling that question how you know and how long is it going to live with them and and um because i don't i don't know if that was something that um it's going to live with him forever or be negative on his life so that's why i was asking you if you did remember that episode and what it felt like for for you because i still want to understand how my kid um, how he mentally got through this. Yeah. You know, for me, it was one of those, like, 
after you know after everything was said and done when i woke up it was like hey i'm still here everything's good i'm like all right and you know just kind of went on about my business the the only well it, it's gonna probably you know with your son too is it's well is it gonna happen again and unfortunately for me it did happen again i had another foot of intestines removed about 15 years later um but going in that time it wasn't so much of am i going to wake up from this one it's if i don't wake up from this one what's going to happen to my kids right and it yeah it, it's rough you know and uh i don't know it, it's one of those like when nothing's going on you don't think about it or at least i didn't and hopefully you know you, your son doesn't dwell on it either um you know he sounds like he's a pretty good pretty resilient kid hopefully you know he'll you know kind of laugh this one off hopefully and uh you know hopefully there's nothing else uh, reoccurring for him well i'm glad you brought that up because one of the biggest things that me and mom and his sister have noticed is that going into this whole process for the last six months from january you can see my son started becoming more quieter He's not talking much. He's not laughing a lot. A lot. He's uh, not playing his gags on his sister. There was a major change in his his uh, you know mentality and and how he dealt with people. So that broke our heart because we knew what was on his mind and what he was doing with that whole time, and that was a long time. So. January, he finally got the operation on April 20th. So he had to go four months processing this thing, as did we. I <laughs> don't have to go through this. Um, and then on top of that, you got the COVID thing. And But um, uh, the thing I we go back to where I was trying to lead to, um, I can easily get sidetracked, but after the surgery like you said he came out of it and was just like oh it's done i'm good i'm okay and uh he's got a pain block i i don't know you might be more familiar with it e it's a type of cryo some type of cryo freeze pain block that they put in that lasts for four months inside the skin i've never heard of that i'm gonna have to look that up now yeah it's (laughs) amazing from what they explained to me they put it in like tor- towards the back and it it uh, freezes and blocks all the nerves that wrap around your chest so like he always laughs and makes jokes he's all my boobs are numb my boobs are numb <laughs> <laughs> he's, <laughs> so it he's sounds like, like his sense of humor is coming back his sense of humor has come back it is he's laughing all the time He's uh, talking too much, um, <laughs> which yeah, I'm, I'll am i let him talk all day long. Um, he's cracking his jokes. He's gone. He's gone. It's Rowan is back. My son is back. He's And with him coming back is also bringing us back and bringing the family back into the norm before this whole January thing hit us because it. As you can imagine, it just, it was so disruptive. Right. And you've been getting some love in here again still. Um, Uh, No one would be mad at you for being, you know, for what you would say, you know, about being evil and all that. Nobody blames you at all. Um, And you even, KZ, may give you an I'm sorry about your whole, you know, Crohn's experience and losing your intestines and the fear you had to go through. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, hey, it's it's all good though. Right, and people are saying it's amazing therapy hearing your son laughing again. It's wonderful to hear that he's back to himself. Um, and we apparently we're having some audio drops on some people out there. I can't hear anything dropping, but you know, I'm the broadcaster. Uh, right. <laughs> well, um, I appreciate it, and I, I. Again, thank you for all the love and and uh, I thought I put this thing on mute. 
And we still have about 10 minutes Bad left. Guess. So if anybody has any questions or if there's anything else you want to talk about or you too, KZ. There's a little bit of a delay between what I say when they hear it and when they can type in a question. So oh, it'll good. be a little bit. How'd you explain <laughs> that? <laughs> Crack some joke and I look dumb for it. <laughs> that, that's just me every day. Uh, well, I, I guess I could let you know that um, I'm not taking as many meds anymore because this whole deal actually put me on antidepressants and um, uh, heavier anti-anxiety meds. Oh, I so, wouldn't doubt it. Um, I really couldn't function without them. But I'm off of the antidepressants and um, I'm back to my normal dose of anti-anxiety meds nice so may is asking yeah. is there a possibility that the mask can return and if so what is the chance so this uh tumor is very rare and one out of 1.5 million people get this tumor and the chances of it coming back at this point for my son is uh very slim to none um because of the fact that they're confident they got all the tissue out. Um, it's a different story if they couldn't get all the tissue out. For instance, my son got lucky because the tumor was encapsulated into the rib cage, and so it didn't attach itself to any of the organs. Even though it was pressing up against the heart and the lungs, it did not attach itself to it because it was under that wow. rib lining. Yeah. Um, so... But because of this and because it's a, a, supposed to be a very slow-growing tumor, he, is, he has to get MRI checks uh, for the next 10 years to make sure that this thing doesn't try to grow back, even though they're confident. So there, it's just an extra measure. But yes, it can grow back. And yes, the, uh, the, um, the tumor, even though it's benign, it can evolve and become malignant. And that was one of the things that they uh, were worried about when all of a sudden it decided to double in size in just a month. They said that could have been a trigger for it to go malignant. And so that's been a blessing that we got it out when we did. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. And Brandy jumped in here. So that's awesome that you aren't having to take as many meds. Also glad to hear your son is back to being himself. Yeah. That... And there was something else about that particular tumor that you were talking about that makes it so unique versus the others that pop up. And what UC Davis is doing exactly as far as spreading information, if you wanted to go into that. Yeah, so... Um... The way this thing uh, doubled in size so quickly, like I said earlier, UC Davis never seen this ever. There's no recorded um, example of this ever happening. And then the other thing that they have never seen is that the thymoma tumor grows up, typically grows off of one gland. And in Rowan's case, it grew off two glands. And UC Davis never seen that either. So they have they have selected Rowan's case um, to be published and to be distributed all throughout the world and the medical um, uh, industry. So that way everybody knows that this tumor has now shown that it acts differently from what everyone else has just known. All right. So we also got uh, from May, you know, if that's such good news and thank you. Klitsana said, I just have to say, I'm impressed with you and your strength. I wish nothing but the best for you and your family. Oh, thank and, you. And I threw out in the chat that you have so much more to talk about, and this is just one example, and I'm sure you'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we talked before, there's there's quite a bit of topics we could be talking about. I mean, we spent, what, an hour and a half, two hours last night just trying to yeah. pin down what to talk about. Yeah, we kind of 
we kind of got a little uh, astray there. And, and then finally, the last five minutes, we're like, um, what is it we're going to talk about? <laughs> right. And Klitsana's eagerly awaiting your return. She's riveted. May agrees. All right. That's good. I appreciate that. And then hopefully uh, he will have me back and, and uh, one day he'll be paying me money. <laughs> <laughs> As KZ over there is still waiting. <laughs> hey, I'm right? waiting. I, we got yeah. Just as an announcement, um, I know that I put it up on Facebook on our webpage, you know, facebook.com/slash/mentallifecast. We have gotten funding for a full year of extended podcasts and more storage, and we're going to start that on season two since we only have one episode left after this for the season. Uh, Brandy says, thank you for sharing the story. You're welcome. Dad, thanks for uh, letting me come on today and, and have the opportunity to share it. Well, as I've been saying, that this is uh, this platform's not so much for me. I'm facilitating, I'm hosting, but this is your guys' platform. This is for whoever wants to come on and talk. I think that's great, too. I'm glad, I'm glad that you've taken a initiative to uh, open up and it's almost like open mic you know but it's uh it's about topics that we really do need to talk about exactly you know it's it's to help us to understand we know we're not alone we all may have different situations but we all have the same general emotions we've all felt a lot of the same stuff um, and even if you haven't, you could still at least, you know, there's empathy. We know, you know, it's kind of crazy. And then also I, the goal also is to try to remove the stigma with mental health and mental issues. Too many people are suffering in silence. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, one of the stigmas is that people do not talk to people because they don't want to be, um, characterized as crazy. Or they don't want their liberties taken from them because they're um, labeled uh, mentally ill. or So people don't talk about it. And we need to get rid of those. Right. I mean, some mental illness is, just been, is like the flu. Except that it's for the mind. You can get over it. Sometimes you can't. It's, but it's not something to go, you know, a scarlet letter on someone. Right. And we got some more. Brandy is celebrating the extended uh, hours and stuff that we're getting here. May agrees. This is such an important discussion to have. Jennifer Ray, I super wish I'd heard more of the story. What I heard sounds like a bouquet of strength and hope and miracles. Ooh, it gets really dark. We're talking, this is almost like the Star Wars saga, where it gets really dark before the light shines. (laughs) I clutch on to this hands down, one of the best mental health podcasts. I eagerly await it every week. Thank you, D, for sharing. This is so important. And right on. Appreciate that. I do have to give a shout out again, as I do every week, to Rachel Conway of Genuine Psychological Services down in Mission Valley and Encinitas. Um, if you are in the area and you need a psychologist, definitely, definitely, definitely check her out. I would use her. I've said that before, but I've known her for too long. We have too much of a relationship, and there's also the geographic barrier. Um, and she's been really helping by sharing our podcast out with, through her social media, through client referrals. It's so uh, yeah, we uh, try to both build up our businesses together here. So yeah, thank you, Rachel, if you're listening. Outstanding. And yeah, next week, man, it's the last episode of the season, and we have a special guest coming. I teased about it a little bit throughout the season. Someone I have had planned since day one. But yeah, so <laughs> this is gonna be great. Oh man, finally ten weeks of broadcasting and keeping this button down and not let anybody know. But yeah, that must be tough. That's it for the week, guys. Thank you again, D, for coming on. Thank you, KZ, for your share. Thank you, everyone that was listening in. Um, make sure give us a like, give us a follow, and we'll see you next week.